Good morning, everyone. I am thrilled. I mean, just thrilled to be here with you in person today. What a treat. And thank you for all of you who are joining us from your homes and your home offices, sipping on your first or maybe third cup of coffee of the day. And speaking of third, as we're kicking it off, Today at this amazing conference, I realize we're following two days that have been filled with action, activity, and information. So I'm thinking that rather than stuffing you with information, I'm going to stuff you with information that by the end of this session is going to be completely transformed into a desire and a determination to go home and do something good for yourself, for your business your company, and for somebody else. So welcome. My name is Eva Helen. I was born and raised in a country that this time of the year is very dark and cold in Northern Europe. But my entire adult life, I have worked in the United States and lived here. As I just trickle through a few things from my past leading up to where we are today, don't just listen to what I say. Think about what you, where you were. What did you experience? What was it like for you? Where are we similar? Where are we different? I started school when I was seven years old, because that's what we did. And I thought that the teacher was infinitely silly with her little letters and numbers around the blackboard. I hated the thought of authority. I didn't like at all when people told me what to do. In junior high, my parents moved me abroad, or all of us, the whole family. And I started a school where there was a concept that was new to me presented, meritocracy. The harder I worked, the more I was rewarded. I absolutely loved it. It was the best thing ever for me. I worked hard, I got good grades, I thrived. What was it like for you? Did you like your first teacher? Did you have good friends in school? Were you a bully? Were you bullied? All of these memories, when we go back and think about them, they're so fascinating because memories shape who we are today. But at the same time, our memories are only as good as they were the last time we talked about them or thought about them. So that means as we're changing, our memories change with us. Well back in my home country, after a few years abroad, I spent the last few years of high school being fairly miserable from an academic perspective. So I took a break, and then I went on to university. And I don't know what it was like when you started college. I've got one kid in college right now. You know when you meet with people who you haven't talked to before? It's not the same crowd that you've been meeting for 25 years and you start to talk about things that are outside of your comfort zone. You start to discuss the world and you complain about all the problems of the world and you say, we're gonna change it. And at some point there, I was exposed to people, I don't remember them, that said, you know, men and women are not treated uh, exactly equally. And I thought, hmm, that's odd, I didn't know that. So I started to seek out organizations and I went to events and I even joined a company that was recruiting C-suite women into to, uh, corporations. And I thought, maybe I should fight for this. So I got up on the barricades and I fought for women's rights and I thought that that's what I was gonna do. But <laughs> when I was done with university, I thought, hmm, I need to go and explore the world. And the airplane ticket to San Francisco was cheaper than the one to Sydney. So that's where I ended up. I was part of starting software companies and running enterprise soft software companies for a long period of time. And about five years ago, I thought, well, what should I do next? I don't know why you are here, but all of this, these memories and these kind of moments of realization, when we kind of wake up and we say, ooh, maybe the world is not so equal after all, they lead us to hopefully some sort of action. So maybe you're here because somebody dragged you here. Somebody in HR said, you should really go and listen to her. It might do you some good. Or 
maybe you came in through the door with a woman who said, let's go check this out. Or maybe you're actually curious to hear what I have to say. But action is interesting. I was thinking, okay, what about when you've tried now for 20 years to kind of convince people at work to create more a more equal environment and to promote women and to get them up to the top, but it's not quite happening as fast as we would like to see. There are definitely some great exceptions. What do we do when it's all been said over and over and over again? We could say it maybe in a different way, a different language. We could say it more loudly. A friend of mine, she went to Sicily to visit some relatives. She didn't speak a word of Italian. And her relatives spoke no English whatsoever. So as the Italian grandmother is standing there stirring in the pot, she just keeps saying the same thing over and over and over, just in a louder voice. My friend, of course, didn't understand any better. Or we could, as my daughter said, why don't we just stop talking? Start acting. Then we'll have something new to talk about. And I thought, that's not a bad idea. We could do that. So the reason I am here is because I think that there might be a gap between you and the people who claim to be experts on these topics of diversity and inclusion. And I'm trying to close that gap by inspiring you, every single one of you, to take a little bit of action, to leave here with something that you can do this afternoon, next hour. I think that it's really important with three things. Communication between you and me, communication between each other, between genders, generations, and business roles. And I think it's really important to lift each other up. Let's use all of that power that we have. We have so much power, each and every one of us. Let's use it to lift each other up rather than pushing each other down. It's so easy to push each other down. And lastly, let's not be so quick to judge. And hey, I'm a culprit too. I mean, big time. I'm standing in the line at the supermarket and the woman in front of me is like, she's too slow, she's not picking up her money fast enough, she's not packing her own bag, she's not smiling at the cashier. And I'm like, oh, who's this? So when you judge, you don't have to stop judging, but I want you to be aware that you're judging. And just go, ooh, where did those ugly thoughts come from? Is that something maybe that I should change? How am I feeling today? Might have something to do with that. So anyway, five years ago, I said, what am I going to do next? And I thought, OK, let me take some action here. I went around to a lot of women's events. I was back in the Bay Area, and uh, I couldn't find any men at the events. So I thought, what if I organize something called Men in Tech, uh, sorry, Women in Tech, an event for guys? And men in tech actually did come. Sometimes they were dragged there by a woman. Sometimes they came on their own. And I would interview women on stage, or they would share their experiences with how men had helped them and supported them. And then I would interview men and ask them, OK, so do you believe there's inequality? Yeah. OK, what are we doing about it? Are you working on it? Is there anything that you would like to do? What are you actually doing? And these conversations were great. So I thought, what an amazing bunch of stories. How do I get more of those, those stories and bring to a broader audience? So I interviewed 60 men in tech or tech-related space, from CEOs to individual contributors, people just like you. And then I took all of that information, and I looked for patterns, and I put all of that information on what I call a matrix. And seven character prototypes emerged. Mark, James, Samir, Memo, Al, Cree, and Richard. The important thing here, and the thing that's different, if you've been to a workshop that's on diversity or inclusion or anything like that, you've been to a workshop, they will give you one message. They'll drown you in information, and they will lose half of you before you even walk into the room, and 70% of you, I was going to say 70% that are left after the first five minutes. What I'm trying to do is respect the fact that everybody starts at a different level. 
So as we go through this today, if you're a man, you're going to start to think about which one is the character prototype who I identify with. And if you're a woman, you might think, hmm, I know this guy. He might be an Al, or he might be a Richard. The key thing here is as we're walking through each step, is that I'm going to keep you in your comfort zone, almost. I'm going to just ask you to stretch yourself a tad bit beyond your comfort zone. So I'm not going to challenge you to do anything unreasonable, I promise. At the top of the matrix, and this is obviously very, very nicely simplified so that we can all follow. At the top of the matrix, we have the advocates, then we have the allies, and then we have the chauvinist. The reason that, another reason I've done it this way is because once you've identified with a character, the, the question that will follow, do you aspire, would you like to do a little bit more for women or minorities where you're working? And remember how I said, I don't like it when people tell me what to do. I'm not assuming that anybody here likes it if I come and tell them what to do. So I'm going to be sharing with you what the person or the character prototype above yours is already doing. So you get examples of what the other guys are already doing. And I think that's important. So I got my, um, I used to drive a Geo Metro way back. And uh, it's great in the snow. And then we purchased a big car for me, you know, to be safer and first child and all of that. And I wasn't feeling like 100% super confident. It was a huge car. But then we went up to the mountains, and there was this woman who was smaller than me physically, and she was driving the same car. And she drove that car like she meant it. And I thought, whoa, if she can do that, so can I. So that's why I think it's so important with examples. These men are, you know, categorized. And of course, um, you have to, you know, you could take it with a grain of salt. You're probably not going to be one of them. Maybe you're a combination of them. But it will give you a sense as we're walking through um, the whole matrix, which one you might be. Let's start with the advocates. So at the top of the matrix, we have the advocates, Mark, James, and Samir. If you're one of them, you understand the value of diversity of thought. You care about the business and you care about the people. You drive change, and you promote women and minorities. You're intelligent and aware of your influence. And you understand why it's so important and necessary to contribute to the business by building diverse teams. If you're Mark, maybe there's one or two here, or maybe in our virtual world there's one or two listening. You're an expert. You are uh, either working inside or outside of the organization. You are, might be an HR or a consultant. And you've been around the block. You've built teams and you're talking about them. You're also super comfortable talking to other men about this and saying, hey, guys, you know, should we try to change the culture around here a little bit? If you're James, you're a change agent. You're a visible presence in the organization. You lead by example. You're confident and undeterred by other people's opinions of you. You build teams that are 50-50. And you look at the culture of the company, and you try to change it wherever you can. And it could be a team. It could be the whole organization. It could be the whole company. You've also started to hire based on talent and potential, and not necessarily always on experience. So I have another thought bubble for you here, because I know that a lot of you who are listening might think diversity and inclusion. Now, what is that? Goes in here, goes out there. Does it actually mean anything to you? So let me tell you what it means to me. It's two sides of the same coin, if you will. One side is how I perceive myself. Like when I was talking about the memories in the past, what my schooling was like, my problem with authority, my love for communication. So it's not just visible differences, right? It is things like, um, how do I process stuff? How do I learn things? How do I draw conclusions? 
How do I connect people? All of these things make me different from a lot of you and similar to a lot of you. And then the other side of that is how am I perceived? I mean, if you've worked with a woman who looked or talked like me and you really didn't like her, you can have a big problem with me here today. But if you think that I'm all, you know, you've worked with somebody who reminds me of somebody that was okay, then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, she seems all right. I'll stick around. Inclusion is a different thing than diversity. So diversity is like how we're different, you and me. But then inclusion is really how we behave and the kind of environment we build and where people feel like they belong and they feel seen and heard. So the last uh, person of the advocates is Samir. And Samir is our sponsor and Samir is, um, just like James, he doesn't care about what other people think about him. He will actually identify women or minorities with potential and put his own name on the line to make them visible and promotable. And he, Samir is very empathetic. He may have experienced a situation where he was an outsider growing up. Maybe he grew up on the wrong side of the road, so to speak. Or it could, be, could have been at work as well. But he has an ability to empathize with a lot of people who are not like the big crowd. So now we've skimmed through the advocates and now we're gonna go to the allies. Now, when I did this research, I kind of had a hunch having, you know, I had worked in tech for 20 years. I know you, not you, individual you, but I do know you. I know this world. I love this world. I keep coming back to this world. I'm passionate about it. And I'm just back doing something different than selling clustered file systems. So, when I did this research, I had this hunch that perhaps there would be more people in the ally category than the advocacy category. And that was true. So based on my research, which is kind of a reflection of more extensive research, Mark, James, and Samir are a much smaller group than Memo, Al, and Cree that fill 65% of my pie. So let's go and talk about the allies for a little bit. The allies are often starting to recognize this thing and they're starting to think about it. Maybe, they, maybe you have a daughter, like if you're an ally, you have a daughter who's starting to bring your attention to these topics. She's gone off to college or maybe she has her first job or maybe you just had a baby daughter and you're thinking, oh, what's the world gonna be like for her? And uh, maybe you've worked on teams with women that have been hugely successful and you're thinking, ah, I wanna build more teams like that. You prefer to speak up on behalf of women on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not in front of a crowd, but you still do in one way or another. So Memo at the top, he's our mentor. And so he mentors women on an ad hoc basis or through structured program. He does small things that lead to bigger things. And the only thing that is a little bit of a hesitation, if it's not through a structured program, he might sometimes think, um, are people misperceiving the, what I'm doing right here? If somebody comes and says, why are you having lunch with Lisa? I thought you had lunch with her last week. And you might say, yeah, uh, well, it's, I'm mentoring her. Oh, yeah, right. And then you back away from that. So there's still a little bit of hesitation. A memo would not like Samir go out and identify somebody who he can promote and make visible. He would wait to be asked. So if you're a woman, you know, you need to go and ask for your mentors. We all know that. Al is our happy-go-lucky ally. He's great, he really wants to help, but he doesn't really know how. And he tends to punt the problem to other people. You know how I said in the beginning that I wanna to try to close the gap between those who are the experts? I think I can say at this point that I'm kind of an expert at this. Five years ago, I didn't know anything. I was sitting where you are. But I wanna close the gap between the experts and you. And so when Al says, I'm gonna punt the problem to somebody else, I'm gonna wait for HR to come in with a program or they're gonna solve it for me. 
not quite sure what it's going to look like, but, you know, I don't have to take responsibility. Well, yes, you do. Please, I would encourage you to take a little bit of responsibility on this topic, because otherwise things are not going to change. So when Al says, I love working with women, he's not quite at the point yet where he says, you know, we need diversity because it's going to lead to more innovation and more creativity on our team. Not quite there yet. So Cree is the last guy of our allies. And Cree is friendly. He's, um, remember how I said that Memo kind of walks away a little bit, maybe not as confident in these kinds of situations. And, and Cree is the same way. He is intimidated by the Me Too movement. He's uncomfortable if, if people start questioning him or they start asking him to take sides or even when the topic of equality comes up, he says, uh, I'm just gonna walk away and he closes his door. That doesn't mean that he doesn't help. But the, the Crees that I interviewed often didn't even know that they were helping. I would ask things like, are you supporting somebody at home? Oh yeah, my, uh, my daughter, my partner. Maybe it's a woman he's worked with closely for many years at work and he's not really aware that he's supporting her. Now with him, we have no absolutely no right to judge. He's okay. Everybody's starting at a different point. So we cannot judge him for not being all over this idea, waking up every morning and saying, you know, I'm really going to change the workplace. And speaking of not judging, we can't judge Richard. We might laugh when we see this picture. But the thing is that there's so many Richards out there. And in the beginning, I was thinking, ah, I don't know, should I include him? What value does he add? And then I thought, well, he's good as a reference point. But then I started to realize it was a while since I did these interviews. And I would follow some of these men, and they would reach out to me and say, hey, how should I approach this situation or that situation? These guys are growing. Some of the Richards I interviewed, they have grown into Crees, some into Al, and a couple even into Memos. We just have to find the right motivation because it differs for every single one. Today is the day my book is available. In this book, which is based on the interviews and the research I've done, the seven character prototypes are described much more in detail than we just skimmed through right now. It's a beautiful book. It's not just black letters on white background. It has pictures, of course, the images of the avatars, the guys, it has photographs. It's something that you can leave out and people will come and flip through it and go, hmm, I wonder which character I am. So, now to the exciting part. You think that you are Cree, and I'm gonna tell you right now, do not try to become Samir overnight. Listen to what Al is doing, and then take that step. If you are Samir, listen to what James is already doing, and go home with that information. So, if you're here because there's something small you'd like to do, let's walk through that. We're going to start from the bottom and work our way up. The things that all of these steps have in common, even though they're so different, is that um, communication is prevalent everywhere. Improving communication between people. Elevating people, as I was talking about. It's so important and a little bit more difficult than pushing people down. And then keep that judgment under control. On each one of these slides, you will find that there is an easy tip. And so if that's all you leave with, easy tip is good enough. If you're Richard and you aspire to do a little something, you might not be motivated by anything else other than facts. And facts are good, you know. Women are an untapped resource. More women than men are graduating from college as it happens. There is a sh talent shortage overall in the tech industry, and we're desperately trying to hold on to our people, right? So they don't move away somewhere else. So get to know a woman on your team. That might sound kind of silly, but it's not. So 
our Cree walks out of the meeting room together with his Essie, who he's worked with for five years, and she said, do you notice what happened in there? This guy was just kind of talking over me. And a Richard would say, oh, and walk away. Cree goes, oh, how, how was that for you? How was that for you? How did you feel? Um, have you experienced that before? Just any little thing that will make you understand what it is that she's thinking and reacting to. You don't have to ask her what the name of her dog or her cat is or what she did last weekend. No need to get personal. You could just ask about an experience that just happened at work. And you can stop right there, that's all. In the case of Cree, maybe he is more comfortable supporting women in a group setting. So here we are, there's a sales team, five sales guys, one woman, she's about to go on maternity leave. She leaves and not the team leader, but the manager's manager says, we're gonna divide all of these accounts up and we're gonna distribute them among the junior sellers. Who knows when she's coming back? But the team leader says, no, 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 no. We're gonna keep these accounts between the senior sales team, so those five guys who are still there, and then when she comes back, we're gonna give them back to her. And they did. So Cree there is comfortable supporting somebody who he wouldn't support on his own, but definitely as part of a group of guys. From Cree to Al, easy tip. Make up, show up and make yourself known as an ally. Well, you're here, you're doing it. Thank you for coming. That's all right, tweet it, put it on LinkedIn. You know, I was listening to this session. That means that people around you will go, oh, I didn't know he was interested in this kind of stuff. Support women who are starting families. You know how I said that that team got together to support the woman who went on maternity leave? One of my owls said, yeah, you know, there was this woman, she was you know, visibly pregnant, kind of far along, and uh, we hadn't really talked about it. I wasn't super comfortable, but I did go up to her and I said, um, just from my experience, my wife and I have had three kids. Um, I know every pregnancy is different, but if there's ever anything I can do to help you, um, just let me know. It doesn't have to be more difficult than that. And it's okay to talk to a woman who's pregnant, I promise. Hold meetings where women are comfortable speaking. You know, this is the one we keep repeating. We talk about this scenario all the time. What does it mean? Well, so, you know, I, um, one of my owls, he's a very good facilitator. So he's sitting around the table. There is, um, I think, three men, two women, and Bob speaks 90% of the time. He happens to be a guy. And Bob speaks and speaks and speaks. So finally, my friend Al says, well, hold on a little bit. You know, let's hear what Mary has to say. Mary presents what she has to say on the topic. Well, I agree with these different things, but I do think that maybe we shouldn't treat the customer that way. Okay, Joe, what do you think about what Mary just said? And make sure Joe is not doing any of that mansplaining stuff where he's like repeating what she just said, but rather responding accurately to what he thinks about what she said. And that one is so common. You know, when I talk to women's groups, this always comes up. Make sure you ask each other between women because the guys are not always asking us. And I want to just put in a little footnote there. So when I say women, I really mean anybody who identifies as a woman. And when I say guys, I mean men most often. If I say you guys, which I still do sometimes, then I mean everybody. But it's really a question of how you identify and what, what you identify as, as is the theme for all of this stuff. From Al to Memo. Now, easy tip, how can I help? You remember that first guy that we had walk out through from the meeting with the woman he's been working with for five years and she said, did you notice that guy was talking over my head? And he goes, yeah, well, how, how, how was that for you? How did that make you feel? And then she goes on to explaining what her experience was like. And if you are ready to become a memo, you will say, oh, is there anything I can do to help if that situation happens again? And here is that one that you've heard before too. When you ask a woman, how can I help? Stop talking and start listening. 
make just a little bit of space for her to express what it is that she's trying to say. Don't interrupt. And as you may know, women are not always looking for a solution. They like to talk about things and come up with their own solutions. But the way that women come up with their solutions is by talking about it. So as you become a mentor, this is a, it's a big step, right? And like I said, a lot of you will only be comfortable mentoring if it's through a formalized program. Great, find a program. If there isn't one inside your company, go find one outside. If you can't find one outside, go back to HR and say, we need a mentoring program because this needs to be standardized. It has to be formal for me to be comfortable. I would love to mentor outside of the usual other men who I'm mentoring. And if HR can't figure it out, have them give me a call. It's not that difficult. Okay? So, as you're mentoring, you build trust and you create a safe space for the mentees. So the safe space is an interesting one. So my friend, who is a memo, he said, um, I had this woman on my team, she was fairly new, I felt that she had amazing capacity. She was a great business leader, she had just figured out the business and the people inside the organization, she was building networks naturally, but Sometimes when we were in meetings, he said, she didn't quite speak up as much as he would have liked to see. So he said, um, I love to debate. Do you, wanna, do you wanna learn how to do that? And she said, yes, absolutely. So they did an informal mentorship where they would meet, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, and they would talk about topics that were sensitive, things that were difficult, things that, you know, how her manager was towards her or whatever it might have been. And they would debate topics, they would pick a fact, and they would debate about it. And she would have a space to practice her voice. So when they then stepped into meetings, and she was uncomfortable, or had in the past been uncomfortable, now she was comfortable speaking up. So that's a, that's a, a kind of mentorship. A lot of other mentorships are, you know, speaking about your own experience. Like, what was it like to build a channel here? Or what was it like to deal with this customer there? So you share your actual experiences. From Memo to Samir. Remember Samir? He's, uh, you know, one step above. He's an advocate. And uh, he's not just waiting for a woman to approach him and say, hey, can you be my mentor? He actually goes out and finds that woman on his own. He will um, provide valuable introductions. What does that mean? Well, we all have pretty big LinkedIn networks, right? We're all sitting on these LinkedIn networks and we're sometimes sharing connections. Sometimes it's more natural, sometimes it's not. And it's really important to provide introductions. I'm on the board of a company and my CEO doesn't get introductions to a lot of the women that are in my world, that are executives that I think he should be talking to. So I provide those introductions. So in that case, I'm like a Samir to him. Take women's challenges seriously. So one of my Samirs, he was sitting in his office, a woman comes in, she sits down and she's clearly upset. They've worked together for a long time. And she says, you know, I love my work, this is great, but it's really stressful and I'm also trying to start a family. Okay, um, well, these are the different things we can do. He came up with solutions, of course, right away, but <laughs> she was kind of asking for solutions. And he said, well, you can, you know, slow the pace a little bit, maybe we can do some job sharing, or maybe you, can, you want to take a sabbatical. And, and she thanked him and, and thought about it, and eventually she left. But two years later, he was able to rehire her, and, you know, they're both super happy, and it's working out really well. So when somebody comes into your office and is upset, don't just brush it off. Try to meet that person as a human being, not just as an employee. Not saying, well, we have all of these things we need to do. Yeah, we all know that we have all of these things to do. And speaking of that, I know how busy all of you are. And you're thinking, well, how am I gonna squeeze all of these things into my day? Well, remember, if you're memo, all you need to do is provide a valuable introduction or two. I'm not asking you to do all of this stuff. So another Samir, um, 
actually, he wasn't a Samir. He was probably a little further down. He was a typical ally. He went overseas with his uh, colleague, who was his, um, his manager. And the manager was a typical Samir. And they're sitting there at the conference table, and it's a very serious conversation. And they're courting the customer. And it's important that they win this deal. Super important. They absolutely cannot make any mistakes. And they're in the final stage of negotiation. And it was all men. There was one woman in the room. And the, uh, the customer says, oh, it's a good thing we don't have women developing these products because then they break all the time. And Samir, the team leader, he said, well, that's not the way we like to think about it. And if you have a problem with that, I suggest that you look elsewhere and don't buy anything from us. They had women in Q&A and engineering and all parts of their development, and they were very proud of that. Of course. Many of you would say, of course. But are you willing to walk away from business to set the record straight? I don't know. All right. So we're into the advocates already, but I just want to point out a couple of main differences. The advocates are bigger risk takers, if you will, whereas the allies might still be concerned about their jobs or how they're perceived or that they might do something wrong, which is okay. The advocates are kind of beyond that. The main difference is that the allies are still looking to themselves. They're still worried, not worried, but they're still um, thinking about themselves more than they're thinking about you. And I think that this is also maybe like a personal evolution thing. I know, at, at least from women, a lot of us are saying, oh, I don't need to prove myself anymore, which is kind of a relief. It's sort of nice. And the focus is turned from us to you. How can I help? So that's the biggest thing. And then there's also that aspect of if you're an ally, you might be supporting women one on one indirectly or directly. But if you're an advocate, you're supporting way more people through your culture change. And it's also so that the actions that you're taking when you're an ally, they tend to be a lot of direct actions, like you know that communication thing, whereas the advocates are doing a lot of things indirectly, influencing bigger groups of people. So, we're reaching the top, from Samir to James. What could there be left? Be a good role model. And that kind of comes with the territory, you know, be a good role model. Um, people are gonna see what you're doing because you are visible. Even if you're just a team leader, you're making sure that other teams and other people know what you're doing. So, you can't really just say one thing and then go home and say something different. You actually, it's a good thing if you're actually believing in what you're doing, I guess is my point. So one of my Jameses, they had a very delicate situation at work. They actually had a conflict between a man and a woman uh, that became a legal case and it was resolved. Um, and then he hired a consultant afterwards because he wanted to make sure that this was a, a, an isolated event and not something that was widespread inside the organization. And indeed it was. But he didn't stop there. He said, okay, let's do this value exercise. And if you work for big companies, you have your value set. But if you're a team leader, you can do this exercise with your team. What values are most important to you? What are the things, and I, and I mean, you as a manager ask your team that. You ask each individual to write down what's important to them. What do they stand for? And then you kind of funnel it down to less and less words. And towards the end, you have a few words that define what the team stands for. That's also a really nice inclusion exercise because everybody feels like they get to participate. Write it down so that those who don't speak as loudly get a voice too. Talent hiring is amazing. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's a typical James, and he said, well, we just hired this new country manager. And uh, he went on to talking about hiring on potential and hiring on talent. And then afterwards, I was thinking about it, and I thought, ah, you hired a country manager who has the potential to be a country manager? 
And he goes, no, 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 no. She already has that down. She has the experience that's required and she can hit the ground running from day one, but she has the potential to lead the entire continent in five years from now. I thought that was really nice. The last step. So what can more can be done? You've done it all. You've built a team with 50-50. You've hired people from minority groups. You've learned all of these things. And you're thinking, OK, well, is there, is there anything more I can do? Well, one thing that's really important is to talk about the success of your team. Talk about it with your peers. And if you're at the top, talk about it with other company leaders. This is how we were successful. This is how we did it. And then the simple things. Say, in my experience, say there's two men sitting in the office and one goes, well, I really think that, uh, you know, we, we, sh we shouldn't let Maddie travel. I mean, she just had a baby and stuff like that. I, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, she must be exhausted. And uh, the other guy goes, well, you know, not in my personal experience, but in my experience, I've got, you know, Sheila and Anna on my team. And Sheila also just had a baby and she came back and she was so smiley and so happy. She had slept her first full night in four months. Use in my experience. Don't say you're wrong, because that doesn't work. Don't say I'm going to tell you what to do. Just say in my experience. And the last story is uh, about a typical Mark who runs a it's sort of a development company that develops software for, for different organizations. And he had a big problem finding diversity as he was hiring. And he had hired an agency, and they were out looking, 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 and all he kept getting back was the same resume, the same resume. resume. And so he thought, well, OK, I can hire another agency. Kind of like I, that thing I said in the beginning, like, what do we do when things are not working? Do we do more of the same, or we do it in a different way? And so he went on um, and thinking about, should I hire somebody else? But then he thought, mm, no, I'm going to go back to them. So he called up the ag agency, and he said, well, rather than um, looking for more candidates. I want you to flip it around. Call all the people that you would normally call and ask them to go to our website and look at what's wrong with it. And then he got invaluable feedback. There were only men represented on the pictures, the benefits weren't listed, and so on. So there are actually things that you can do if you're a little bit creative and at the top of this matrix. So since you're here, I'm assuming that you are probably already an al, at least. And so when you leave from here, or right now, pick up your phone. Maybe you've thought about somebody during this conversation, somebody who you would like to support. Say, hey, I was just listening to this woman talking about how I can be a better ally. I'd like to start by asking if I can support you in any way. If you're open to it, would you consider a 15-minute call on Friday at 11 o'clock? So today is my pre-launch for you only. The book is available on my website, not on Amazon yet. You can buy it now, and you can use the TSIA code for a discount. And if you're looking for me, I'm on LinkedIn mostly, Twitter sometimes. And before we go to Q&A, I just want to thank you so much for your attention this morning. Thank you.